two years ago, a drunk named Deke Slater had left Hedenbeck's Tavern at the same time that Jim Lassiter had been driving toward town to chair a fundraising committee at St. Paul's Church. Traveling at high speed on Black Oak Road, Slater's Buick ran head-on into Jim's car. Jim died instantly, and Slater was paralyzed from the neck down. Often, when they passed Hedenbeck's, and when they rounded the curve where Jim had been killed, Tommy tried to conceal his enduring anguish by involving Meg in a jokey conversation. Not today. He had already run out of one-liners. White screen, Mom. She went through the intersection and across the township line. Main Street became a two-lane county route, Black Oak Road. Tommy had adjusted intellectually, for the most part emotionally as well, to the loss of his father. During the year following the tragedy, Meg had often come upon the boy as he sat quietly at a window, lost in thought, tears slipping down his face. She hadn't caught him weeping for ten months. Reluctantly, he had accepted his father's death. He would be okay. Nevertheless, that didn't mean he was whole. Still, and perhaps for a long time to come, there was an emptiness in Tommy. Jim had been a wonderful husband, but an even better father, so devoted to his son that they essentially had been a part of each other. Jim's death left a hole in Tommy as real as any that a bullet might have made, although it would not scar over as fast as a gunshot wound. Meg knew that only time could knit him completely. Snow began to fall faster, and dusk surrendered to night, reducing visibility, so she slowed the jeep wagon. Hunching over the wheel, she could see ahead only twenty yards. Getting bad, Tommy said tensely from the rear seat. Seen worse. Where, the Yukon? Yep, exactly right. Middle of the gold rush, winter of 1849. You forgetting how old I am? I was mushing Yukon dog sleds before they'd invented dogs. Tommy laughed, but only dutifully. Meg could not see the broad meadows on either side, or the frozen silver ribbon of Seeger's Creek off to the right, although she could make out the gnarled trunks and jagged winter-stripped limbs of the looming oaks that flanked that portion of the county road. The trees were a landmark by which she judged that she was a quarter mile from the blind curve where Jim had died. Tommy settled into silence. Then, when they were seconds from the curve, he said, I don't really miss sledding and skating so much. It's just, I feel so helpless in this cast, so, so trapped. His use of the word trapped wrenched Meg, because it meant that his uneasiness about being immobilized was closely linked to memories of his dad's death. Jim Chevy had been so mangled by the impact that the police and coroner's men had required more than three hours to extract his corpse from the overturned car, ensnared by tangled metal. His body had to be cut loose with acetylene torches. At the time, she had tried to protect Tommy from the worst details of the accident, but when eventually he returned to his third-grade class, his schoolmate shared the grisly facts with him, motivated by a morbid curiosity about death and by an innocent cruelty peculiar to some children. You're not trapped in the cast, Meg said, as she piloted the jeep into the long, snow-swept curve. Hampered, yeah, but not trapped. I'm here to help. Tommy had come home early from his first day of school after the funeral, bawling. Daddy was trapped in the car, couldn't move, all tangled up in the twisted metal. They had to cut him loose. He was trapped. Meg soothed him and explained that Jim had been killed on impact, in an instant, and had not suffered. Honey, it was only his body, his poor empty shell that was trapped. His mind and soul, your real daddy, had already gone up to heaven. Now, Meg braked as she approached the midpoint of the curve. That curve, which would always be a frightening place, no matter how often they navigated it. Tommy had come to accept Meg's assurances that his father had not suffered. Nevertheless, he was still haunted by the image of his dad's body in the clutch of mangled metal. Suddenly, oncoming headlights seared Meg's eyes. A car rushed at them, moving too fast for road conditions. Not out of control, but not stable either. It started to fishtail, straddling the double line down the center of the road. Meg pulled the steering wheel to the right, swinging onto the hard shoulder, pumping the brakes afraid of putting two wheels in a ditch and rolling the station wagon. She held it all the way around the curve, however, 
with the tires churning up gravel that rattled against the undercarriage. The oncoming car skinned past with no more than an inch to spare, vanishing in the night and snow. Idiot, she said angrily. When she had driven around the bend into a straightaway, she pulled to the side of the road and stopped. You okay? she asked. Tommy was huddled in one corner of the back seat, with his head pulled turtle-like into the collar of his heavy winter coat. Pale and trembling, he nodded. Yeah, yeah, okay. The night seemed strangely still, in spite of the softly idling jeep, the thump of windshield wipers, and the wind. I'd like to get my hands on that irresponsible jerk. She struck the dashboard with the flat side of her fist. It was a biolimet car, Tommy said, referring to the large research firm located on a hundred acres half a mile south of their farm. I saw the name on the side, Biolimec. She took several deep breaths. You okay? Yeah, I'm all right. I just want to get home. The storm intensified. They were beneath the snowy equivalent of a waterfall, flakes pouring over them and churning currents. Back on Black Oak Road, they crawled along at 25 miles an hour. Weather conditions wouldn't permit greater speed. Two miles farther, at Biolamec Labs, the night was shot full of light. Beyond the nine-foot-high chain-link fence that ringed the place, sodium vapor security lamps glowed eerily atop twenty-foot poles, the light diffused by thickly falling snow. Although the lamps were set at hundred-foot intervals across the expanse of grounds, that surrounded the single-story offices and research laboratories, they were rarely switched on. Meg had seen them burning on only one other night in the past four years. The buildings were set back from the road, beyond a screen of trees. Even in good weather and daylight, they were difficult to see, cloistered and mysterious. Currently, they were invisible in spite of the hundred or more pools of yellow light that surrounded them. Hairs of men in heavy coats moved along the perimeter of the property, sweeping flashlights over the fence, as if expecting to find a breach, focusing especially on the snow-mantled ground along the chain link. Somebody must have tried to break in, Tommy said. Biolimet cars and vans were clustered around the main gate. Sputtering red emergency flares flickered and smoked along both shoulders of Black Oak Road, leading to a roadblock at which three men held powerful flashlights. Three other men were armed with shotguns. Wow, Tommy said. Doorbuster riot guns. Something really big must have happened. Meg braked, stopped, and rolled down her window. Cold wind knifed into the car. She expected one of the men to approach her. Instead, a guard in boots, gray uniform pants, and a black coat with the Biolomac logo moved toward the jeep from the other side, carrying a long pole at the base of which were attached a pair of angled mirrors and a light. He was accompanied by a much taller man, similarly dressed, who had a shotgun. The shorter guard thrust the lighted mirrors beneath the jeep and squinted at the reflection of the undercarriage that the first mirror threw onto the second. They're looking for bombs, Tommy said from the rear seat. Bombs? Meg said disbelievingly. Hardly. The man with the mirror moved slowly around the jeep wagon, and his armed companion stayed close at his side. Even in the obscuring snow, Meg could see that their faces were lined with anxiety. When the pair had circled the jeep, the armed guard waved an all-clear to the other four at the roadblock, and at last one man approached the driver's window. He wore jeans and a bulky brown leather flight jacket with sheepskin lining, without a biolimec patch. A dark blue toboggan cap caked with snow was pulled half over his ears. He leaned down to the open window. I'm real sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. He was handsome, with an appealing, but false, smile. His gray-green eyes were disturbingly direct. What's going on? she asked. Just a security alert, he said, the words steaming from him in the icy air. Could I see your driver's license, please? He was evidently a Biolomec employee, not a police officer, but Meg saw no reason to decline to cooperate. As the man was holding her wallet, studying the license, Tommy said, Spies try to sneak in there tonight? That same insincere smile accompanied the man's response. Most likely just a short circuit in the alarm system, son. Nothing here that spies would be interested in. Biolimec was involved in recombinant DNA research and the application of their discoveries to commercial enterprises. 
Meg knew that in recent years, genetic engineering had produced a man-made virus that threw off pure insulin as a waste product, a multitude of wonder drugs, and other blessings. She also knew that the same science could engender biological weapons, new diseases as deadly as nuclear bombs. But she always avoided pondering the frightening possibility that Biolomech, half a mile overland from their house, might be engaged in such dangerous work. In fact, a few years ago, rumors had surfaced that Biolomech had landed a major defense contract. But the company had assured the county that it would never perform research related to bacteriological warfare. Yet their fence and security system seemed more formidable than necessary for a commercial facility limited to benign projects. Blinking snow off his lashes, the man in the sheepskin line jacket said, You live near here, Mrs. Lassiter? Cascade Farm, she said, about a mile down the road. He passed her wallet back through the window. From the back seat, Tommy said, Mister, do you think terrorists with bombs are maybe going to drive in there and blow the place up or something? Bombs? Whatever gave you that idea, son? The mirror's on the pole, Tommy said. Ah, well, that's just part of our standard procedure in a security alert. Like I said, it's probably a false alarm. Short circuit, something like that. To Meg, he said, Sorry for the trouble, Mrs. Lassiter. As the man stepped back from the station wagon, Meg glanced past him at the guards with shotguns and at more distant figures combing the eerily lighted grounds. These men did not believe that they were investigating a false alarm. Their anxiety and tension were visible not only in the faces of those nearby, but in the way that all of them stood and moved in the blizzard-shot night. She rolled up the window and put the car in gear. As she pulled forward, Tommy said, You think he was lying? It's none of our business, honey. Terrorists or spies, Tommy said, with the enthusiasm for a good crisis that only young boys could muster. They passed the northernmost end of Biolomex land. The sodium vapor security lights receded into the gloom behind them, while the night and snow closed in from all sides. More leafless oaks thrust spiky arms over the lane. Among their thick trunks, the jeep headlights stirred brief-lived, leaping shadows. Two minutes later, Meg turned left off the county route into their quarter-mile driveway. She was relieved to be home. Cascade Farm named after three generations of the Cascade family who once lived there, was a ten-acre spread in semi-rural Connecticut. It was not a working farm anymore. She and Jim had bought the place four years ago, after he had sold his share in the New York ad agency that he'd founded with two partners. The farm was to have been the start of a new life, where he could pursue his dream of being a writer of more than ad copy, and where Meg could enjoy an art studio more spacious and in a more serene environment than anything she could have had in the city. Before he died, Jim had written two moderately successful suspense novels at Cascade Farm. There, also, Meg found new directions for her art, first a brighter tone than she previously had employed. Then, after Jim's death, a style so brooding and grim that the gallery handling her work in New York had suggested a return to the brighter style if she hoped to continue to sell. The two-story fieldstone house stood a hundred yards in front of the barn. It had eight rooms plus a spacious kitchen with modern appliances, two baths, two fireplaces, and front and back porches for sitting and rocking on summer evenings. Even in the stormy darkness, its scalloped eaves bedecked with ice, battered by wind, and lashed by whips of snow, with not a single front window warmed by a lamp's glow, the house looked cozy and welcoming in the headlights. Home she said with relief. Spaghetti for dinner? Make a lot so I can have cold leftovers for breakfast. Yuck. Cold spaghetti makes a great breakfast. You're a demented child. She pulled alongside the house, stopped next to the rear porch, and helped him out of the wagon. Leave your crutches. Lean on me, she said over the whistling, hooting wind. The crutches would be of no use on snow-covered ground. I'll bring them in after I put the jeep in the garage. If the heavy cast had not encased his right leg from toes to above the knee, she might have been able to carry him. Instead, he leaned on her and hopped on his good leg. She had left a light in the kitchen for Doofus, their four-year-old black Labrador. The frost-rhymed window shimmered with that amber glow, and the porch was vaguely illuminated by it. 
At the door, Tommy rested against the wall of the house while Meg disengaged the lock. When she stepped into the kitchen, the big dog did not rush at her, wagging his tail with excitement as she expected. Instead, he slunk forward with his tail between his legs, his head down, clearly happy to see her, but rolling his eyes warily, as if expecting an angry cat to streak at him suddenly from one corner or another. She pushed the door shut behind them and helped Tommy to a chair at the kitchen table. Then she took off her boots and stood them on a rag rug in the corner by the door. Doofus was shivering, as though cold. But the oil furnace was on, and the place was warm. The dog made an odd mewling sound. What's the matter, Doofus? she asked. What have you been up to? Knock over a lamp, huh? Chew up a sofa cushion? Ah, uh, he's a good pooch, Tommy said. If he knocked over a lamp, he'll pay for it. Won't you, Doofus? The dog wagged his tail, but only tentatively. He glanced nervously at Meg, then looked back toward the dining room, as if someone lurked there, someone he feared too much to confront. Sudden apprehension clutched Meg. Two. Ben Parnell left the roadblock near the main gate and drove his Chevy Blazer to lab number three, the building deepest in the Biolamec complex. Snow melted off his toboggan cap and trickled under the collar of his sheepskin-lined flight jacket. All across the grounds, anxious searchers moved cautiously through the sulfur-yellow glow of the security lamps. In deference to the stinging wind, they hunched their shoulders and held their heads low, which made them appear less than human, demonic. In a strange way, he was glad that the crisis had arisen. If he hadn't been there, he would have been at home, alone, pretending to read or pretending to watch television, but brooding about Melissa, his much-loved daughter, who was gone, lost to cancer. And if he could have avoided brooding about Melissa... He would have brooded instead about Leah, his wife, who had also been lost to... Lost to what? He still did not fully understand why their marriage had ended after the ordeal with Melissa was over. As far as Ben could see, the only thing that had come between him and Leah had been her grief, which had been so great and dark and heavy that she had no longer been capable of harboring any other emotion. Not even love for him. Maybe the seeds of divorce had been there for a long time, sprouting only after Melissa succumbed. But he had loved Leah. He still loved her. Not passionately anymore, but in the melancholy way that a man could love a dream of happiness, even knowing that the dream could never come true. That's what Leah had become during the past year. Not even a memory, painful or otherwise, but a dream, and not even a dream of what might be, but of what could never be. He parked the blazer in front of Lab 3, a windowless single-story structure that resembled a bunker. He went to the steel door, inserted his plastic ID card in the slot, reclaimed the card when the light above the entrance changed from red to green, and stepped past that barrier as it slid open with a hiss. He was in a vestibule, that resembled the airlock of a spaceship. The outer door hissed shut behind him, and he stood before the inner door, stripping off his gloves while he was scanned by a security camera. A foot-square wall panel slid open, revealing a lighted screen painted with the blue outline of a right hand. Ben matched his hand to the outline, and the computer scanned his fingerprints. Seconds later, when his identity was confirmed, the inner door slid open and he went into the main hall, off which led other halls, labs, and offices. Minutes ago, Dr. John Acuff, head of Project Blackberry, had returned to Biolamec in response to the crisis. Now Ben located Acuff in the East Wing Corridor, where he was conferring urgently with three researchers, two men and a woman, who were working on Blackberry. As Ben approached, he saw that Acuff was half sick with fear. The director of the project, stocky, balding, with a salt-and-pepper beard, was neither absent-minded nor coldly analytic, in no way a stereotypical man of science. 
and in fact he possessed a splendid sense of humor. There was usually a merry, positively Clausian twinkle in his eyes. No twinkle tonight, however, and no smile. Ben, have you found our rats? Not a trace. I want to talk to you, get some idea where they might go. Acuff put one hand against his forehead, as if checking for a fever. We've got to get them, Ben. And quick. If we don't recover them tonight... Jesus, the possible consequences. It's the end of everything. Three. The dog tried to growl at whoever was in the darkness beyond the archway, but the growl softened into another whine. Meg moved reluctantly yet boldly to the dining room, fumbling along the wall for the light switch, clicked it. The eight chairs were spaced evenly around the Queen Anne table. Plates gleamed softly behind the beveled panes of the big china cabinet. Nothing was out of place. She had expected to find an intruder. Doofus remained in the kitchen, trembling. He was not an easily frightened dog, yet something had spooked him. Badly. Mom? Stay there, she said. What's wrong? Turning on lamps as she went, Meg searched the living room and the book-lined den. She looked in closets and behind large pieces of furniture. She kept a gun upstairs but didn't want to get it until she was sure that no one was downstairs with Tommy. Since Jim's death, Meg had been paranoid about Tommy's health and safety. She knew it, admitted it, but could do nothing about her attitude. Every time he got a cold, she was sure it would become pneumonia. When he cut himself, no matter how small the wound, she feared the bleeding, as if the loss of a mere teaspoon of his blood would be the death of him. When, at play, he had fallen out of a tree and broken his leg, she'd nearly fainted at the sight of his twisted limb. If she lost Tommy, whom she loved with all her heart, she would not only be losing her son, but the last living part of Jim as well. More than her own death, Meg Lassiter had learned to fear the deaths of those she loved. She had been afraid that Tommy would succumb to disease or accident, but, although she'd bought a gun for protection, she had not given much thought to the possibility that her boy might fall victim to foul play. Foul play. That sounded so melodramatic. Ridiculous. After all, this was the country uninfected by the violence that had been such a part of life in New York City. But something had shaken the usually boisterous Labrador, a breed prized for gameness and courage. If not an intruder, what? She stepped into the front hall and peered up the dark stairs. She flicked a wall switch, turning on the second floor lights. Her own courage was draining away. She had stormed through the first floor rooms, driven by fear for Tommy's welfare, giving no consideration to her safety. Now she began to wonder what she would do if she actually encountered an intruder. No sound descended from the second floor. She could hear only the keening and susurrant wind. Yet she was overcome by a prescient feeling that she should not venture into the upper rooms. Perhaps the wisest course would be to return with Tommy to the station wagon and drive to the nearest neighbors, who lived more than a quarter mile north on Black Oak. From there, she could call the sheriff's office and ask them to check out the house from attic to basement. On the other hand, in a rapidly escalating blizzard, travel could be hazardous even in a four-wheel drive jeep. Surely, if an intruder was upstairs, Doofus would be barking furiously. The dog was somewhat clumsy, but he was no coward. Maybe his behavior had not been indicative of fear. Maybe she had misinterpreted his symptoms. His tucked tail, hung head, and trembling flanks could have been signs of illness. Don't be such a wimp, she said angrily, and she hurriedly climbed the stairs. The second floor hall was deserted. She went to her room and took the 12-gauge piston grip, short-barreled Mossberg shotgun from under the bed. It was an ideal weapon for home protection, compact, yet plenty powerful enough to deter an assailant. To use it, she didn't have to be a marksman for the spread pattern of the pellets guaranteed a hit if only she aimed in the general direction of an attacker. Furthermore, by using lightly loaded shells, she could deter an aggressor without having to destroy him. She didn't want to kill anyone. In fact, hating guns, she might never have acquired the Mossberg 
if she'd not had Tommy to worry about. She checked her son's room. No one there. The two bedrooms at the back of the house had been connected with a wide archway to make one studio. Her drawing board, easels, and white enameled art supply cabinets were as she had left them. No one lurked in either of the bathrooms. Jim's office, the last place she searched, was deserted too. Evidently, she had misinterpreted the Labrador's behavior, and she felt a bit sheepish about her overreaction. She lowered the shotgun and stood in Jim's office, composing herself. After his death, Meg had left the room untouched, so she could use his computer to write letters and do bookkeeping. In fact, she also had sentimental reasons for leaving his things undisturbed. The room helped her to recall how happy Jim had been with a novel underway. He'd had a charmingly boyish aspect that was never more visible than when he was excited about a story, elaborating on a kernel of an idea. Since his funeral, she sometimes came to this room to sit and remember him. Often, she felt trapped by Jim's death, as if a door had slammed shut and locked after him when he had stepped out of her life, as if she were now in a tiny room behind that door, with no key to free herself, with no window by which she could escape. How could she build a new life, find happiness, after losing a man she had loved so deeply? What she'd had with Jim had been perfection. Could any future relationship equal it? She sighed, turned off the light, and closed the door on her way out. She returned the shotgun to her own room. In the hall, as she approached the head of the stairs, she had the peculiar feeling that someone was watching her. This uncanny awareness of being under observation was so powerful that she turned to look back up the hall. Empty. Besides, she had searched everywhere. She was certain that she and Tommy were alone. You're just jumpy because of that maniac jerk on Black Oak Road, driving as if he's guaranteed to live forever. When she returned to the kitchen, Tommy was sitting in the chair where she'd left him. What's wrong? he asked worriedly. Nothing, honey. The way Doofus was acting? I thought maybe we had a burglar, but no one's been here. Did old Doofus break something? Not that either, she said. Not that I noticed. The Labrador was no longer slinking about with his head held low. He wasn't trembling either. He was sitting on the floor beside Tommy's chair when Meg entered the room, but he got up, patted to her, grinned, and nuzzled her hand when she offered it. Then he went to the door and scratched at it lightly with one paw, which was his way of indicating that he needed to go outside to relieve himself. I'll put the jeep away. Take off your coat and gloves, she told Tommy. But don't you get out of that chair until I come back with your crutches. She pulled her boots on again and went outside, taking the dog with her, into a storm that had grown more fierce. The snowflakes were smaller and harder, almost sand-like. They made millions of tiny ticking sounds as they struck the porch roof. Undaunted by the storm, Doofus dashed into the yard. Meg parked the station wagon in the barn, which served as a garage. When she got out of the jeep, she glanced up at half-seen rafters in the gloom above, they creaked as gusts of wind slammed into the roof. The place smelled of oil drippings and grease, but the underlying sweet scent of hay and livestock had not entirely dissipated, even after all these years. As she took Tommy's crutches out of the wagon, she again felt that creepy prickling at the back of her neck, an awareness of being watched. She surveyed the dim interior of the old barn, which was illuminated only by the inadequate bulb on the automatic door opener. Someone could have been lurking behind one of the board dividers that separated the area along the south wall into horse stalls. Someone might be crouching in the loft above. But she saw no evidence of an intruder to justify her suspicion. Meg, you've been reading too many mysteries lately, she said aloud, seeking reassurance from the sound of her own voice. Carrying Tommy's crutches, she stepped outside, pushed the automatic door button, and watched the segmented metal panels roll down until they met the concrete sill with a solid clunk. When she reached the middle of the yard, she stopped, struck by the beauty of the winter nightscape. The scene was revealed primarily by the ghostly radiance of the snow on the ground, a luminescence akin to moonlight, but more ethereal, and, in spite of the ferocity of the storm, more serene. Marking the northern end of the yard were five leafless maples, stark black branches spearing the night, 
Wind-hammered snow had begun to plate the rough bark. By morning, she and Tommy might be snowbound. A couple of times every winter, Black Oak Road was closed for a day or two by drifts. Being cut off from civilization for short periods wasn't particularly inconvenient and, in fact, had a certain appeal. Though strangely lovely, the night was also hard. The tiny pellets of snow stung her face. When she called Doofus, he appeared around the side of the house, half seen in the dimness, more a phantom than a dog. He seemed to be gliding over the ground, as if he were not a living creature, but a dark revenant. He was panting, wagging his tail, unbothered by the weather, invigorated. Meg opened the kitchen door. Tommy was still sitting at the table. Behind her, Doofus had halted on the top porch step. Come on, Pooch, it's cold out here. The Labrador whined, as if afraid to return to the house. Come on, come on. It's supper time. He climbed the last step and hesitantly crossed the porch. He put his head in the open door and studied the kitchen with suspicion. He sniffed the warm air and shuddered. Meg playfully bumped one boot against the dog's bottom. He looked at her reproachfully and did not move. Come on, boy. You going to leave us in here unprotected? Tommy asked from his chair by the table. As if he understood that his reputation was at stake, the dog reluctantly slunk across the threshold. Meg entered the house and locked the door behind them. Taking the dog's towel off a wall hook, she said, Don't you dare shake your coat till I've dried you, pooch. Doofus shook his coat vigorously as Meg bent to towel his fur, spraying melted snow in her face and over nearby cabinets. Tommy laughed, so the dog looked at him quizzically, which made Tommy laugh harder. And Meg had to laugh, too, and the dog was buoyed by all the merriment. He straightened up from his meat crouch, dared to wag his tail, and went to Tommy. When she and Tommy had first come home, perhaps they had been tense and frightened because of the crash they'd narrowly avoided at the blind curve on Black Oak Road, and maybe their residual fear had been communicated to Doofus, just as their laughter now lifted his spirits. Dogs were sensitive to human moods, and Meg saw no other explanation for Doofus's behavior. Four. The windows were frosted over, and the wind was wailing outside, as if it would abrade the whole planet down to the size of a moon, then an asteroid, then a speck of dust. The house seemed all the cozier by contrast. Meg and Tommy ate spaghetti at the kitchen table. Doofus wasn't acting as strangely as he had earlier, but he was not himself. More than usual, he sought companionship, even to the extent that he didn't want to eat by himself. Meg watched with surprise and amusement as the dog pushed his dish of Alpo across the floor with his nose to a spot beside Tommy's chair. Next thing you know, Tommy said, he's going to want to sit in a chair and have his plate on the table. First, Meg said, he'll have to learn to hold a fork properly. I hate it when he holds a fork backward. We'll send him to charm school, Tommy said, twirling long strands of spaghetti onto his fork. And maybe he can learn to stand on his hind feet and walk like a real person. Once he can stand erect, he'll want to learn to dance. He'll cut a fine figure on the ballroom floor. They grinned at each other across the dinner table, and Meg relished the special closeness that came only from being silly together. In the past two years, Tommy had too seldom been in the mood for frivolity. Lying on the floor by his dish, Doofus ate his alpo, but didn't gobble it as usual. He nibbled daintily, frequently lifting his head and raising his floppy ears to listen to the wind moaning at the windows. Later, as Meg was washing the dinner dishes, and as Tommy was sitting at the table reading an adventure novel, Doofus suddenly let out a low woof of alarm and sprang to his feet. He stood rigidly, staring at the cabinets on the other side of the room, those between the refrigerator and the cellar door. As she was about to say something to soothe the dog, Meg heard what had alarmed him, a rustling inside the cabinets. Mice, Tommy said hopefully, for he loathed rats. Sounds too big for mice. They'd had rats before. After all, they lived on a farm that had once been attractive to rodents because of the livestock feed stored in the barn. Although the barn housed only a jeep now, and though the rats had sought better scavenging elsewhere, they returned once every winter, as if the long-ago status of Cascade Farm as a rat haven 
still stirred in the racial memory of each new generation. From within the closed cabinet came the frenzied scratching of claws on wood, then a thump as something was knocked over, then the unmistakable sound of a rat-thick, sinuous body slipping along one of the shelves, rattling the stacks of canned goods as it passed between them. Really, Big, Tommy said, wide-eyed. Instead of barking, Doofus whined and padded to the other end of the kitchen, as far from the rat-inhabited cabinet as he could get. At other times, he had been eager to pursue rats, although he was not especially successful at catching them. As she dried her hands on the dish towel, Meg wondered again about the dog's loss of spirit. She went to the cabinet. There were three sets of doors, top to bottom, and she put her head against the middle set, listening. Nothing. It's gone, she said after a long silence. You're not going to open that, are you? Tommy asked when she put her hand on one of the door handles. Well, of course I am. I have to see how it got in, if maybe it's chewed a hole in the cabinet backing. But what if it's still in there? The boy asked. It's not, honey. Anyway, it's disgusting and filthy, but it's not dangerous. Nothing's more cowardly than a rat. She thumped the cabinet with one fist to be sure she scared off the foul thing, if in fact it was in there. She opened the middle doors, saw everything was in order, got on her hands and knees, and opened the lower doors. A few cans were knocked over. A new box of saltines was chewed open. The contents plundered. Doofus whimpered. She reached into the lower cupboard and pushed some of the canned goods aside. She removed several boxes of macaroni and put them on the floor beside her, trying to get a look at the back wall of the cabinet. Just enough light from the kitchen seeped into that secluded space to reveal a ragged edged hole in the plywood backing, where the rat had chewed through from the wall behind. A vague, cool draft was flowing out of the hole. She got up, dusting her hands together. Yep, it's definitely not Mickey Mouse stopping by for a visit. This is a genuine capital R, capital A, capital T. Better get the traps. As Meg stepped to the cellar door, Tommy said, You're not leaving me alone. Just till I get the trap, Sonny. But, but what if the rat comes around while you're gone? It won't. They like to stay where it's dark. The boy was blushing, embarrassed by his fear. It's just, with this leg, I couldn't get away if it came after me. Sympathetic, but aware that coddling him would encourage his irrational fear, she said, It won't come after you, Skipper. It's more scared of us than we are of it. She switched on the cellar lights and went down the stairs, leaving him with Doofus. The shadowy basement was lighted by two bulbs dimmed by dust. She found six heavy-duty traps on the utility shelves, rat breakers with steel hammers, not flimsy mouse traps, and a box of warfarin poisoned food pellets, and she took them upstairs without seeing or hearing the unwelcome house guest. Tommy sighed with relief when she returned. There's something weird about these rats. There's probably only one she said, as she put the traps down on the counter by the sink. What do you mean, weird? They've got doofus jumpy, like he was when we came home, so it must have been rats that spooked him then, too. He doesn't spook easy. So what is it about these rats that have him so nervous? Not rats, plural, Meg corrected. There's probably just the one, and I don't know what's gotten under that pooch's skin. He's just being silly. Remember how he used to be scared witless by the vacuum cleaner? He was just a puppy then. No, he was scared of it until he was almost three, she said, as she took from the refrigerator a packet of budding dried beef, with which she intended to bait the traps. Sitting on the floor beside his young master's chair, the dog rolled his eyes at Meg and whined softly. In truth, she was as unnerved by the Labrador's behavior as Tommy was, but by saying so, she would only feed the boy's anxiety. After filling two dishes with the poisoned pellets, she put one in the cupboard under the sink and the other in the cabinet with the saltines. She left the ravaged crackers as they were, hoping the rat would return for more and take the warfarin instead. She baited four traps with beef. She put one in the cabinet under the sink. The second went in the cabinet with the saltines and the dish of warfarin, but on a different shelf from the poison. She placed the third trap in the walk-in pantry and the fourth in the basement. When she returned to the kitchen, she said, Let me finish washing the dishes. 
Then we'll move into the living room. We might nail it tonight, but certainly by tomorrow morning. Ten minutes later, on leaving the kitchen, Meg turned off the lights behind them, hoping that the darkness would lure the rat out of hiding and into a trap before she retired for the night. She and Tommy would sleep better knowing that the thing was dead. While Meg built a fire in the living room fireplace, Doofus settled in front of the hearth. Tommy sat in an armchair, put his crutches nearby, propped his cast-bound leg on a footstool, and opened his adventure novel. Meg programmed the compact disc player with some easy listening music and settled into her own chair with a new novel by Mary Higgins Clark. The wind sounded cold and sharp, but the living room was cozy. In half an hour, Meg was involved in the novel when, in a lull between songs, she heard a hard snap from the kitchen. Doofus lifted his head. Tommy's eyes met Meg's. Then a second sound. Snap. Two, the boy said. We caught two at the same time. Meg put her book aside and armed herself with an iron poker from the fireplace in case the prey needed to be struck to finish them off. She hated this part of rat catching. She went to the kitchen, switched on the lights, and looked first in the cabinet beneath the sink. In the dish, the poisoned food was almost gone. The beef was gone from the big trap, too. The steel bar had been sprung, but no rat had been caught. Nevertheless, the trap wasn't empty. Caught under the bar was a six-inch long stick of wood, as if it had been used to spring the trap so the bait could be taken safely. No, that was ridiculous. Meg took the trap from the cupboard to have a closer look. The stick was stained dark on one side, natural on the other. A strip of plywood, like the plywood backing in all the cabinets, through which the rat had chewed to get at the saltines. A shiver shook her, but she remained reluctant to consider the frightening possibility that had given rise to her tremors. In the cupboard by the refrigerator, the poisoned bait had been taken from the other dish. The second trap had been sprung, too, with another stick of plywood. The bait had been stolen. What rat was smart enough? She rose from her knees and eased open the middle doors of the cabinet. The canned goods, the packages of jello, the boxes of raisins, and the boxes of cereal looked undisturbed at first. Then she noticed the brown, pea-sized pellet on the shelf in front of an open box of all bran, a piece of warfer and bait. But she had not put any bait on the shelf with the cereal. All of it had been in the dish below or under the kitchen sink so a rat had carried a piece of it onto the higher shelf. If she hadn't been alerted by the pellet, she might not have noticed the scratch marks and small punctures on the package of Albran. She stared at the box for a long time before she took it off the shelf and carried it to the sink. She put the poker on the counter and, with trembling hands, opened the cereal box. She poured some into the sink. Mixed in with the Albran were scores of poison pellets. She emptied the entire box into the sink. All the missing bait from both plastic dishes had been transferred to the cereal. Her heart was racing, pounding so hard that she could feel the throb of her own pulse in her temples. What the hell is going on here? Something screeched behind her, a strange, angry sound. She turned and saw the rat. A hideous white rat. It was on the shelf where the Albran had been, standing on its hindquarters. The shelf was fifteen inches high, and the rat was not entirely erect because it was about eighteen inches long, six inches longer than an average rat, exclusive of its tail. But its size wasn't what iced her blood. The scary thing was its head, twice the size of an ordinary rat's head, as big as a baseball, out of proportion to its body, and oddly shaped, bulging toward the top of the skull, eyes and nose and mouth, squeezed in the lower half. It stared at her and made clawing motions with its upraised forepaws. It bared its teeth and hissed, actually hissed as though it were a cat, then shrieked again. And there was such hostility in its shrill cry and in its demeanor that she snatched up the fireplace poker again. Though its eyes were beady and red like any rat's, there was a difference about them that she could not immediately identify. The way it stared at her so boldly was intimidating. She looked at its enlarged skull. The bigger the skull, the bigger the brain. And suddenly realized 
that its scarlet eyes revealed an unthinkably high, unrat-like degree of intelligence. It shrieked again, challengingly. Wild rats weren't white. Lab rats were white. She knew now what they had been hunting for at the roadblock at Biolamec. She didn't know why their researchers would have wanted to create such a beast as this. And though she was a well-educated woman and had a layman's knowledge of genetic engineering, she didn't know how they had created it. But she knew beyond a doubt that they had created it, for there was no place else on Earth from which it could have come. Clearly, it had not ridden on the undercarriage of their car. Even as Biolamec security men had been searching for it, this rat had been here, out of the cold, setting up house. On the shelf behind it, and on the three shelves below it, other rats pushed through cans, bottles, and boxes. They were repulsively large and pale like the mutant that still challenged her from the cereal shelf. Behind her, claws clicked on the floor. More of them. Meg did not even look back, and she didn't delude herself into thinking that she could handle them with a poker. She threw that useless weapon aside and ran for her shotgun upstairs. Five. Ben Parnell and Dr. Acuff crouched in front of the cage that stood in one corner of the windowless room. It was a six-foot cube with a sheet metal floor that had been softened with a deep layer of silky yellow-brown grass. The food and water dispensers could be filled from outside, but were operable from within, so the occupants could obtain nourishment as they desired it. One-third of the pen was equipped with miniature wooden ladders and climbing bars for exercise and play. The cage door was open. Here, see? Acuff said. It locks automatically every time the door is shut. Can be left unlocked by mistake. And once shut, it can only be opened with a key. Seems safe to us. I mean, we didn't think they'd be smart enough to pick a lock. But surely they didn't. How could they, without hands? You ever take a close look at their feet? A rat's feet aren't like hands, but they're more than just paws. There's an articulation of digits that lets them grasp things. It's true of most rodents. Squirrels, for instance. You've seen them sitting up, holding a piece of fruit in their forepaws. Yes, but without an opposable thumb. Of course, Acuff said. They don't have great dexterity, nothing like we have. But these aren't ordinary rats. Remember, these creatures have been genetically engineered. Except for the shape and size of their craniums, they aren't physically much different from other rats. But they're smarter. A lot smarter. Acuff was involved in intelligence enhancement experiments, seeking to discover if lower species, like rats, could be genetically altered to breed future generations with drastically increased brain power in hope that success with lab animals might lead to procedures that would enhance human intelligence. His research was labeled Project Blackberry in honor of the brave, intelligent rabbit of the same name in Richard Adams's Watership Down. At John A. Cuff's suggestion, Ben had read and immensely enjoyed Adams's book but he had not quite decided whether he approved or disapproved of Project Blackberry. Anyway, Acuff said, whether they could have picked the cage lock is debatable, and maybe they didn't, because there's this to consider. He pointed to the slot in the frame of the cage door where the stubby brass bolt was supposed to fit when engaged. The slot was packed full of a grainy brown substance. Food pellets. They chewed up food pellets, then filled the slot with the paste so the bolt couldn't automatically engage. But the door had to be open for them to do that. It must have happened during a maze run. A what? Well, there's this flexible maze we constantly reconfigure, half as big as this whole room. It's made of clear plastic tubes with difficult obstacles. We attach it to the front of the cage, then just open their door, so they go straight from the cage into the maze. We were doing that yesterday, so the cage was open a long time. If some of them paused at the door before entering the maze, if they 
sniffed around the lock slot for a few seconds, we might not have noticed. We were more interested in what they did after they entered the maze. Ben rose from a crouch. I've already seen how they got out of the room itself. Have you? Yeah. They went to the far end of the long room. Near floor level, something had tampered with an 18-inch square intake duct to the building's ventilation system. The grill had been held in place only by light tension clamps, and it had been torn away from the opening behind it. Acuff said, Have you looked in the exchange chamber? Because of the nature of the work done in lab number three, all air was chemically decontaminated before being vented to the outside. It was forced under pressure through multiple chemical baths in a five-tiered exchange chamber as big as a pickup truck. They couldn't get through the exchange chamber alive, Acuff said, hopefully. Might be eight dead rats in those chemical baths. Ben shook his head. There aren't. We checked. And we can't find vent grills disturbed in other rooms where they might have left the ducks. You don't think they're still in the ventilation system? No, they must have gotten out at some point, into the walls. But how? PVC pipe is used for the ductwork, pressure sealed with a high-temperature bonding agent at all joints. Ben nodded. We think they chewed up the adhesive at one of the joints, loosened two sections of pipe enough to squeeze out. We found rat droppings in the crawlspace attic, and a place where they gnawed through the subroof and the overlying shingles. Once on the roof, they could get off the building by gutters and downspouts. John Acuff's face had grown whiter than the salt part of his salt-and-pepper beard. Listen, we've got to get them back tonight, no matter what. Tonight. We'll try. Just trying isn't good enough. We've got to do it. Ben, there are three males and five females in that pack, and they're fertile. If we don't get them back, if they breed in the wild... Ultimately... They'll drive ordinary rats into extinction, and then we'll be faced with a menace unlike anything we've known. Think about it. Smart rats that recognize and elude traps, quick to detect poison bait, virtually ineradicable. Already the world loses a large portion of its food supply to rats, 10 or 15 percent in developed countries like ours, 50 percent in many third world countries. Ben... We lose that much to dumb rats. What'll we lose to these? We might eventually see famine even in the United States, and in less advanced countries, there could be starvation beyond imagination. Frowning, Ben said. You're overstating the danger. Absolutely not. Rats are parasitical. They're competitors. And these will be competing far more vigorously and aggressively than any rats we've ever known. The lab seemed as cold as the winter night outside. Just because they're a bit smarter than ordinary rats, more than a bit, scores of times smarter, but not as smart as we are, for heaven's sake. Maybe half as smart as the average man, Acuff said. Ben blinked in surprise. Maybe even smarter than that, Acuff said. Fear evident in his lined face and eyes. Combine that level of intellect with their natural cunning, size advantage. Size advantage? But we are much bigger. Acuff shook his head. Small can be better. Because they're smaller, they're faster than we are. And they can vanish through a chink in the wall, down a drain pipe. They're bigger than the average rat, about eighteen inches long instead of twelve, but they can move unseen through the shadows because they're relatively small. And size isn't their only advantage, however. They can also see at night, as well as in daylight. Doc, you're starting to scare me. You better be scared half to death, because these rats we've made, this new species we've engineered, is hostile to us. Finally, Ben was forming an opinion of Project Blackberry. It wasn't favorable. Not sure he wanted to know the answer to his own question, he said. 
What exactly do you mean by that? Turning away from the wall vent, walking to the center of the room, planting both hands on the marble lab bench, leaning forward with his head hung down and his eyes closed, Akuf said, We don't know why they're hostile. They just are. Is it some quirk of their genetics? Or have we made them just intelligent enough so they can understand that we're their masters and resent it? Whatever the reason, they're aggressive, fierce. A few researchers were badly bitten. Sooner or later, someone would have been killed if we hadn't taken extreme precautions. We handled them with heavy bite-proof gloves, wearing plexiglass face masks, suited in specially made Kevlar coveralls with high, rolled collars. Kevlar! That's the stuff they make bulletproof vests out of, for God's sake, and we needed something that tough because these little bastards were determined to hurt us. Astonished, Ben said. But why didn't you destroy them? We couldn't destroy a success, Acuff said. Ben was baffled. Success? From a scientific point of view, their hostility wasn't important because they were all so smart. What we were trying to create was smart rats, and we succeeded. Given time, we figured to identify the cause of the hostility and deal with it. That's why we put them all in one pen, because we thought their isolation in individual cages might be to blame for their hostility, that they were intelligent enough to need a communal environment, that housing them together might mellow them. Instead, it only facilitated their escape. Akov nodded. And now they're loose. Six. Hurrying along the hall, Meg passed the wide archway to the living room and saw Tommy struggling up from his chair, groping for his crutches. Doofus was whining, agitated. Tommy called to Meg, but she didn't pause to answer because every second counted. Turning at the newel post, starting up the stairs, she glanced back and could see no rats following her. The light wasn't on in the hallway itself, however, so something could have been scurrying through the shadows along the baseboard. She climbed the steps two at a time and was breathing hard when she reached the second floor. In her room, she took the shotgun from under the bed and chambered the first of the five rounds in the magazine. A vivid image of rats swarming through the cabinet flickered across her mind, and she realized that she might need additional ammo. She kept a box of fifty shells in her clothes closet, so she slid open that door and cried out in surprise when two large white rats scuttled across the closet floor. They clambered over her shoes and disappeared through a hole in the wall, moving too fast for her to take a shot at them, even if she had thought to do so. She'd kept the box of shells on the closet floor, and the rats had found it. They had chewed open the cardboard carton and stolen the shells one at a time, carrying them away through the hole in the wall. Only four rounds were left. She scooped them up and stuffed them into the pockets of her jeans. If the rats had succeeded in making off with all the shells, would they then have tried subsequently to find a way to remove the last five rounds from the shotgun's magazine as well, leaving her defenseless? Just how smart were they? Tommy was calling her, and Doofus was barking angrily. Meg left the bedroom at a run. She descended the steps so fast that she risked twisting an ankle. The Labrador was in the first floor hall, his sturdy legs planted wide, his blocky head lowered, his ears flattened against his skull. He was staring intently toward the kitchen, no longer barking but growling menacingly, even though he was also trembling with fear. Meg found Tommy in the living room, standing with the aid of his crutches, and she let out a wordless cry of relief when she saw that no rats were swarming over him. Mom, what is it? What's wrong? The rats. I think. I know they're from Bilomech. That's what the roadblock was all about. That's what those men were looking for with their spotlights, with the angled mirrors they poked under the car. She swept the room with her gaze, looking for furtive movement along the walls and beside the furniture. How do you know? the boy asked. I've seen them. You'll know it too if you see them. Doofus remained in the hall, but Meg took small comfort from the warning growl he directed toward the kitchen. She realized the dog was no match for these rats. 
they'd trick or overpower him without difficulty as soon as they were ready to attack. They were going to attack. Besides being genetically altered, with large skulls and brains, they behaved differently from other rats. By nature, rats were scavengers, not hunters, and they thrived because they skulked through shadows, living secretively in walls and sewers. And they never dared to assault a human being unless he was helpless, an unconscious wino, a baby in a crib. But the Bilomech were bold and hostile, hunters as well as scavengers. Their scheme to steal her shotgun shells and disarm her was clear preparation for an attack. His voice shaky, Tommy said. But if they aren't like ordinary rats, what are they like? She remembered the hideously enlarged skull, the scarlet eyes informed with malevolent intelligence, the pale and plump and somehow obscene white body. She said, I'll tell you later. Come on, honey, we're getting out of here. They could have gone out the front door around the house and across the rear yard to the barn in which the jeep was parked, but that was a long way through driving snow for a boy on crutches. Meg decided they would have to go through the kitchen and out the back. Besides, their coats were drying on the rack by the rear door, and her car keys were in her coat. Doofus bravely led them along the hall to the kitchen, though he was not happy about it. Meg stayed close to Tommy, holding the pistol grip pump action 12 gauge ready in both hands. Five shells in the gun, four in her pockets. Was that enough? How many rats had escaped Bilomech? Six? Ten? Twenty? She would have to avoid shooting them one at a time, save her ammunition until she could take them out in twos or threes. Yes, but what if they didn't attack in a pack? What if they rushed at her singly, from several different directions, forcing her to swivel left and right and left again, blasting at them one at a time until her ammunition was all gone? She had to stop them before they reached her or Tommy, even if they came singly, because once they were on her or climbing the boy— the shotgun would be useless. Then she and Tommy would have to defend themselves with bare hands against sharp teeth and claws. They'd be no match for even half a dozen large, fearless, and smart rats intent on tearing out their throats. But for the wind outside and the tick of granular snow striking the windows, the kitchen was silent. The cupboard stood open as she had left it, but no rats crouched on the shelves. This was crazy. For two years she had worried about raising Tommy without Jim's help. She'd been concerned about instilling in him the right values and principles. His injuries and illnesses had scared her. She had worried about how she would handle unexpected crises if they arose. But she had never contemplated anything as unexpected as this. Sometimes she had taken comfort in the thought.